yeah good evening friends uh, welcome to our uh, uh, 50th webinar today and we have, it's a long journey and we have been through uh, so many international faculties and in all these webinars it's a special webinar today and we have uh, none other than uh, dr peter j millet he's from stedman clinic us and uh, we were talking to all of you and you said that he is the guy you want to hear regarding rotator cuff and shoulder arthroscopy so i think we have here uh, all all uh, efforts due to dr shreyash kajar uh, may i request dr shreyash to kindly introduce uh, professor millet to all of us and then we uh, carry forward with the presentation uh, shreyash please yeah sure uh, thank you and hello everyone i am shreyash gajjar from mumbai and uh, rotator cuff problems are very common presentation uh, in our practice although we have got better in terms of the understanding right from etiology to management there are still of a lot of unsolved and unanswered questions and this is where we look for evidence and experience uh, as to where we are today and where do we head tomorrow and uh, we have none other than dr peter j millet uh, who is going to talk uh, on rotator cuff tears where we are today he is an internationally recognized orthopedic surgeon who specializes in disorders of the shoulder elbow knee and all sports related injuries he performed his orthopedic residency from the reputed hospital for special surgery in new york and has received many awards of excellence during that time he subsequently completed fellowship training with dr richard hawkins and uh, richard stedman prior to coming to wale in 2005 dr millet was formerly co-director of the harvard shoulder service and the harvard shoulder fellowship at the prestigious brigham and women's in massachusetts general hospitals at the stedman clinic he is a partner and has been consistently selected as one of the best doctors in america and has been ranked in the top 1% of orthopedic surgeons by the us news and world reports uh, on the academic side he has authored over 200 peer reviewed scientific articles numerous book chapters and four books on orthopedics sports medicine and shoulder surgery his academic work has been recognized with awards from several international societies In 2016 he received the achievement award from the AAOS for his contributions to the field and also outstanding teacher award from the fellows of the Stedman Clinic and the Stedman Philippon Research Institute. He served as a chairman of the research committee for the ANA and the chairman of the education committee for ASES. Dr. Millet clinically has treated elite athletes from NFL, NBA, MLB, NHL PGA Formula 1 X Games and the Olympics and is currently a consultant to the NHL Player Association and the MLB Players Association Dr Millet has served as a medical director for Ski and Snowboard Club Wales he has served as a team physician for the United States Ski and Snowboard Association US ski team and as a consultant to the Montreal Canadiens professional hockey club outside work he does outstanding work in the community and despite his very busy work schedule and family commitments he has kindly promptly accepted my invitation and on behalf of the indian arthroscopy society we are very grateful and privileged to have dr millet to please talk on rotator cuff tears where we are today over to you great thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you to the indian arthroscopy society for this kind invitation It's really a great honor for me to to present to you. It's early morning here. I know it's a Friday evening there, and uh, it's. Uh, I hope that you all can stay awake for my talk. I'm going to talk about um, rotator cuff and where we are in 2020. Can you see my slide? My slide, okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Great. If there's any um, issues uh, on the transmission, please just interrupt me, um, and we'll leave some time at the end for question and answer. Sure. So this is going to be kind of a, a a little bit of a history, of my personal history of how we've gotten to where we are in 2020 for rotator cuff repair, um, and I think the journey hopefully will uh, share some key points, which hopefully will translate to better care for your patients. I do have some disclosures. I'm a consultant and receive royalties for some of the products that are uh, shown here from Arthrex. Um, I do receive royalties for publishing from Springer and Medbridge. 
and then I'm a founding investor in the uh, View Medi educational website. So I'm from Vail, Colorado, uh, which is here in the middle of the United States in the Rocky Mountains. I originally grew up in Pennsylvania on the east coast of the United States uh, and traveled around a bit, but I've been here since 2005. Uh, this is what Vail is known for. This is one of our uh, back bowls with my wife skiing on a powder day. Um, and this is what our valley looks like. It sits in the, at the base of the Gore Range Mountains here in this beautiful valley. And our hospital is right, uh, right about here. Uh, and the reason that I'm here is because of the Stedman Clinic. The Stedman Clinic is a internationally known sports medicine center. Uh, and we're known uh, not only for the excellent surgery, which was uh, really pioneered by Dr. Stedman and Dr. Hawkins, who I did my fellowship with, um, but also because we have an amazing research facility as well. We have uh, dual fluoral systems. We have a biomechanics lab with a KUKA robot. We have a bioskills lab uh, that allows us to really do a lot of uh, testing of new procedures. Uh, we also have a, a fellowship program. We take eight U.S. fellows per year. And we also have an international scholars program where we have uh, surgeons come from around the world and spend a year with us. So we've had a number of people from Germany, France. I don't think we've had anyone from India, but uh, the, the invitation is open uh, and we'd love to have you. And this is a, a picture of a little reunion we have with some of my fellows. And now I've trained over 100 fellows from the US and abroad. Um, we have an interesting uh, patient population. We take care of a lot of elite athletes, uh, professional athletes. This is a professional NFL quarterback. This is an NFL defensive tackle. Uh, and we have a lot of visitors. This is a visiting surgeon from the UK. This is a visiting surgeon from, from uh, Belgium. Uh, and we really enjoy the, the shared uh, sharing of ideas and um, uh, showing what we're doing, but also learning what they're doing. Uh, vale is also a great place to recreate. Um, I like to ski. I, I play cowboy sometimes on the weekend at a ranch. Uh, and if you come here in the winter, I might even give you a ride in my snowcat if you get stuck at the airport. Um, no problem, we can make it through any snow drift. So special thanks before I get started to uh, Shrush for organizing this and really pursuing the, 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 um, the date and everything. I know it wasn't easy to coordinate, but I appreciate your perseverance. Also to our moderators and coordinators, it's really a great honor for me to present tonight to the Indian Arthroscopy Society. Um, when I was looking at the history of the Indian Arthroscopy Society, I thought it was interesting that it was founded uh, by Dr. Vora, who was trained actually by Dr. Dinesh Patel. And Dinesh Patel has a special place in my heart because he and I were co-faculty and partners at Harvard Medical School and at the Mass General Hospital from 2001 to 2005. And he really became a mentor, a colleague, a friend, and he it really was uh, an inspirational figure in my early career. And I oftentimes uh, remember that the words of wisdom he shared with me, and I can see why he inspired uh, the passion for arthroscopy in India as well. So we have a, a common heritage there. So tonight I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, rotator cuff repair and the goals of rotator cuff repair really haven't changed from the lessons we learned from Dr. Neer in the early 70s uh, and Dr. Codman even before him. And the goals are to restore the anatomy so that we can recreate the biomechanics of the shoulder. We would like to have strong fixation so that uh, we don't have re-tears uh, and we want to promote healing and we want to achieve, achieve not only pain relief, but improved function uh, for our patients. My evolution on arthroscopic rotator cuff repairs, I really did zero arthroscopic rotator cuff repairs during my, my residency. This is a picture of my mentor in residency, Dr. Russ Warren. This is Dr. Richard Hawkins, who was my mentor in fellowship. And this is Dr. Stebman, who was my other mentor in fellowship. And during my fellowship, I even did uh, zero arthroscopic rotator cuff repairs. Uh, when I started my practice in 2001, uh, I moved to Boston and went, joined the faculty at Harvard Medical School with J.P. Warner, and I did my first arthroscopic rotator cuff repair. It took uh, three and a half to four hours. I used metal anchors and ethabon sutures. And uh, quickly thereafter, the technology changed and my skill set evolved, 
And by 2003, I was doing about 150 per year, and it's just expanded since then. The evolution here, we did single row with uh, anchors. Then around 2001, we started to think about uh, trying to improve our results by doing a double row configuration. And then in 2003, I, I switched to this, what we call the mattress double uh, anchor linked, where we linked the medial and lateral rows. And I think for me, that was really a, uh, an important um, uh, tipping point in, the, in my uh, evolution on rotator cuff repairs. Uh, it evolved into this uh, crisscross Xbox configuration that then went on to these transosseous equivalent types of repairs, both with knotted and now tape bridging constructs, uh, knotless constructs. Uh, and this is the original drawings that we did uh, for the paper that we published in 2004, uh, really kind of developing this concept of linking the medial and lateral rows. Around that time, right as we were starting to to, right as I was starting to feel confident with my um, arthroscopic skills and being able to actually technically do rotator cuff repairs arthroscopically, Lisa Gallitz uh, from Washington University published this seminal paper uh, in JBGS and they found that really we weren't doing so well with our uh, rotator arthroscopic rotator cuff repairs and 17 out of 18 had re-tears on ultrasound. Uh, and after two years, only about um, two thirds had ASCS scores greater than 80. So really not great results with the early uh, arthroscopic repairs. So that made us really start thinking about this and going back to the lab and trying to figure out why we weren't getting these good results. Uh, in 2020, where I am now is I'm in a double row, knotless linked, uh, self-reinforcing uh, repair with suture tape and optimized anchors. We've moved away from the metal anchors with the uh, uh, eyelets that would fray the suture. And what we have now is we have predictable outcomes, which I'll share with you. The advantages of these, uh, these newer techniques is it minimizes the surgical techniques, or mi minimizes the surgical steps. It maximizes tendon to bone fixation strength. It optimizes tendon to bone healing. Uh, it enhances your surgical precision and speed, and, and most importantly, it improves the outcomes for our patients. Uh, these are some of my fellows and re uh, colleagues and researchers who've really helped to contribute to a lot of the work that went behind these concepts and validated uh, and studied this in the lab uh, and also called all the patients to get the follow-up, which I'll share with you. So the advances uh, that we've had over the last uh, two decades, we have improved suturing techniques. We learned about different suture patterns, uh, how to uh, increase the strength of the suture in the tendon. We learned about different knot types and, knot and knotless anchors, which have been developed to uh, improve the consistency of our fixation. We learned about releases and margin convergence to go for a, a tension free or to, to have minimal tension on the repair. We learned about double row fixation and how to put, where to put the anchors. The best bone quality is here medially at the bone tendon interface at the articular margin and then laterally. So by placing anchors in those locations, uh, we, we take advantage of the best bone fixation. Uh, we have also have improved anchor design with fully threaded anchors that actually gain purchase on the thin cortical rim. Uh, and we also have learned about uh, anchors which are vented, which allow access to the marrow and the elements inside the bone that can assist with healing. We've also learned about the principle of self-reinforcement and how we place our sutures, meaning that the harder we pull on this tendon, the more it's gonna be compressed analogous to a Chinese finger trap. An important uh, concept also is to learn about the, the different types of rotator cuff tears that we see. Not all tears are the same. There, the pattern recognition, I think, has become crucial. This was originally described by DeOrio and Cofield, where they described the size of the tear, which was important. But then, really, Davidson and Steve Burkhardt are to be credited with really uh, developing these concepts of understanding the tear patterns. And they describe these uh, five basic tear patterns with crescent-shaped tears, U-shaped tears, L-shaped tears, uh, chronic L, uh, you can also have reverse L, and then massive tears. And then, uh, identifying the tear pattern really helps to predict what type of repair you're gonna need. 
Uh, for example, with these L-shaped tears, you're going to need some type of side-to-side -side fixation. Uh, and these massive tears, frequently, you'll need some type of side-to-side -side margin convergence fixation if you're going to repair those. Crescent-shaped tears usually can be pulled over and fixed right to the tuberosity. U-shaped tears, uh, some side-to-side -side, uh, repair is necessary to decrease the tension as well. Um, the advantages of the link construct are really that they provide this so-called self-reinforcement as described by Steve Burkhart, meaning that the harder you pull on the tendon, the more the construct compresses the tendon into the bone. And that's due to two factors. One is there's a normalizing force which compresses it, the tendon down the harder that, the, that you pull on this construct. And also there's a wedge that occurs between the, the suture and the, the, um, the tendon and the harder you pull, the more it wedges the tendon down into the bone. We also have a decreased suture cut throw and less load per unit area because the force is dispersed over the whole construct. And that decreases the risk of a type two tear. That's particularly enhanced with the knotless configurations and also with using uh, tape, which disperses the load over a greater surface area. You also avoid having any foreign materials at the tendon bone interface, which improves vascular inflow healing to the tendon and allows the healing to occur from the bone up into the tendon. There's no overtensioning with medial knots. Uh, the knotless constructs avoid irritation in the subacromial space. And there's better biology because the ta tapes actually act as a bioscaffold. They have improved biomechanical properties and actually they're very, very uh, favorable for fibroblasts to grow onto them. And I'll show you some second looks where you can see that the tapes get completely covered with new tissue very early. The principle of self-reinforcement really is something that uh, Steve Burkhart uh, described. It was a concept we initially thought of when we were um, coming up with this link construct, but he was the one who really described it. And then Max Park and Ty Lee uh, looked at this in the lab and they initially compared it with the uh, initial transactions equivalent with the suture bridge construct with uh, uh, knots tied medially. They placed, a tech, they placed a, a tech scan to measure pressure as they pulled on the, on the repair. And what they found with the, the link construct was that there was increased um, compressive load or contact pressure the harder you pulled versus a, a non-link construct. So this basically validated the concept of self-reinforcement. I like to think of it uh, like the safety nets that line the ski slopes where we live. Uh, when a racer goes off the course, there's multiple rows, multiple fixation points, and it's all linked. So instead of hitting one firm object, the whole, uh, the whole construct can absorb the load. And that's what we see with a large tear like this with a sixth anchor extended link construct or a repair where the, the, whole f the, the loading on the tendon can be dispersed over this whole construct. Um, what about the results of, of double row versus single row repairs? There's a number of papers on this. This is one that we did with Ryan Worth, where we looked only at the level one studies. Um, and we uh, found that there were about 567 repairs, minimum of six month follow up. And the clinical outcomes were similar, but there was a, a lower retear rate in the double row uh, repair. By, by about uh, 10 or 11%, which is significant if you're doing um, you know, 100 rotator cuff repairs a year, that's 11 patients, one per month, that doesn't have a retear because uh, you've performed double row type repair. Uh, this is what it looks like. This is a knotless uh, double row repair. This is a right shoulder viewing from laterally. I usually use four anchors. Uh, this is the anterior medial anchor here being placed. Um, here you can see it going in. This is the poster lateral in place. We, I, I like to retrieve the suture tapes out laterally uh, and then pass it with a uh, uh, shuttling type instrument. And then here you can see pulling it over and compressing it into the uh, lateral row uh, here, taking one suture tape from each medial anchor and compressing it down um, into the lateral row. Uh, this is now the, uh, the second lateral anchor going in place. Uh, here we're viewing from posterior lateral. Now we're placing the anchor uh, anterolaterally uh, and screwing it in flush with the cortex. 
and cutting the tapes. And then you can see the completed repair here. So this is what we would do for typical crescent shaped tears. This is a little bit larger tear. This is a, a younger patient in his late forties who fell from a ladder. He had a small avulsion fracture with a large tear. You can see the biceps is also, the pulleys uh, also involved. So we did a biceps team thesis on him as well. Uh, and we do that in about 80% of our patients. We'll prepare the footprint, uh, remove that little bone fragment. Uh, I like to uh, remove all the soft tissues from the lateral cortex. I don't like to create a trough and I don't like to weaken the cortex in any way. Uh, but I do like to prepare a nice bleeding bone surface. And then we'll do an extended speed bridge repair, extended link construct here, double row with four anchors medially and four anchors laterally, compressing the tendons back down onto the footprint. Um, we, we looked at our early results. This was our two-year results with uh, Chris Cottigan, uh, 155 shoulders, looking at the knotted versus knotless, originally when the knotless constructs came out. You know, we were concerned as were others that maybe we weren't, uh, they weren't gonna be as strong. Uh, and we did a propensity score model um, looking at these two different repairs and we found excellent clinical results with both. Uh, we did find slightly higher ASCS score with the tape bridge compared, compared to the knotted suture. And actually on those who had uh, follow-up MRIs, uh, which was about a third of the patients we were able to get back for MRIs, we had lower retears with the knotless uh, construct. So that gave us confidence to go forward that we certainly weren't doing anything worse. And uh, if not, if we, if we were, we were potentially doing something, uh, something better. Uh, these types of constructs with the linked repairs, I think are adaptable, uh, which is really nice. You can uh, do just an, a, a knotless uh, configuration as you show here, you can do an extended type bridging construct that I showed in that one case. Uh, the most I've done has been 14 all the way from the teres all the way over to the subscapularis for a very large massive tear after a dislocation. Uh, you can add in extra sutures if you have dog ears. Uh, the dog ears do remodel over time, but if you're gonna have one, sometimes it's good to plan for that. You can put extra sutures in. Uh, you can also put a patch underneath it. Uh, if you like, if you have a complex tear, you can uh, add in additional sutures uh, uh, to, to secure the fixation and make it stronger uh, or deal with different leaflets of the tear. All tears aren't created equally. So I think the adaptability of these types of constructs really is, a, is, a, is an important um, uh, value for the surgeon. We also know that healing occurs relatively quickly. Uh, this is a case example here. This is a a right shoulder, this is early on when I was starting to, to use these types of link constructs. Uh, you can see we're preparing the footprint uh, and then we'll place our medial anchor again here. And then this is the completed repair. There's a bit of a dog ear uh, posteriorly that you can see, but uh, this is the repair. Six weeks later, he had a fall. Uh, he was diagnosed as a re-tear by a really well-known radiologist in New York and um, we went back uh, and looked at his shoulder, um, and you can see here the healing that's already occurred at six weeks. You can see the neovascularization, you can see that the tendons reapproximated, and you can see how the, the uh, suture tapes are completely covered with new fibrous uh, healing tissue. So um, the message is that healing occurs quickly, and the healing tissue has high signal characteristics on a follow-up MRI for some time. So, uh, some of that high signal may be just immature healing tissue, not necessarily a retear. In this case, the patient had a little bit of adhesive capsulitis. We did a capsule release and he went on to a, a successful outcome. Uh, this is another second look that I had. This is a, a left shoulder. This was a, a three anchor repair, one medial and two lateral, compressing the tendon down. Uh, but the patient did develop adhesive capsulitis, a failed conservative treatment. You can see here at four months, we went in and looked at it, and this is what it looks like with complete coverage of the tapes with a new uh, tissue and good approximation down onto the footprint of the uh, tuberosity and healing at the articular margin on the, on the articular side. So in this case, we did a capsule release and the patient went on to a good result as well. 
there are a number of technical pitfalls. Um, I think when I first started doing these, I, I put the sutures too close. I think you can spread them out at about one, uh, 10 to 12 millimeter intervals. Uh, dog ears uh, are something to think about. Uh, usually if you plan for them, you can place an additional suture in the dog ear and incorporate that into your lateral row, or you can use one of the sutures from one of the uh, lateral anchors, the eyelet suture, to secure this down, uh, and that can be helpful. Uh, soft bone is something that we deal with from time to time. In, in cases of soft bone, I'll go to a smaller punch or I'll go to a larger anchor. Uh, if it's really soft, sometimes I'll do cortical augmentation with a, uh, either a, a suture plate button or some type of cortical augmentation device. And lack of tension is something that's usually not a problem with the smaller tears, that's usually on the larger tears. And what I've found is that if I work from the uh, outside of the tears in, that I usually don't have tension. So I'll, I'll start anteriorly, then go posteriorly, and then gradually work towards the middle. And usually I, I avoid an issue where I have lack of tension in the repairs. Uh, with poor quality tendon, you can have more complex suture patterns like uh, Mason Allen type sutures or ripstop type sutures to deal with this. Uh, as I mentioned with poor quality bone, I think having the interconnected anchors really disperses the force so there's less of a risk of an anchor pulling out. Uh, different anchor sizes, different punch sizes can be helpful. Uh, we try and optimize the biology locally with vented anchors. Uh, if the bone is bleeding after I prepare it, then that's usually sufficient. However, sometimes the bone is quite sclerotic, in which case I will uh, also do a microfracture using a, a small power pick uh, to microfracture the surface underneath the repair site to get additional healing. And then I always address associated pathology, whether that be the acromion, the AC joint, or the biceps. And about 80% of the time, we're doing a biceps tenodesis or tenotomy in our cases of rotator cuff repairs because the biceps is diseased, there's an associated degenerative slap tear, or the biceps pulley mechanism has been disrupted by the tear. Um, just a word about the acromion. I, I do an acromioplasty in most of my cases. I think that the bleeding helps uh, with the healing. I like to make it into a type one acromion. I also have started to look at the critical shoulder angle uh, that's described by Christian Gerber. And if they have an angle which is greater than 35 degrees, then I'll usually also consider doing a lateral acromioplasty, uh, taking off up to five to seven millimeters of the acromion uh, on the lateral aspect uh, to decrease the, deltoid, the upward vector of the deltoid force to try and uh, protect my repair. I don't have data to support that yet, but we do have data suggesting that these patients with a larger acromial index or larger critical shoulder angle definitely have a higher risk of, uh, of uh, rotator cuff tears and potentially have a higher risk of re -tear. So hopefully by modifying that, we can protect our repairs a bit. Uh, a question about should we tie the knots? Um, I don't think in, in 2020, knot tying is absolutely essential uh, for a standard Repair, I, I personally do not. Uh, if it's a complex tear with multiple leaflets, sometimes I'll use knots to secure it down or deal with dog ears. Uh, this is a study that uh, Max Park did looking at knotless versus knotted. Uh, the concept is that if you tie knots medially, that the force gets concentrated there and therefore the lateral part of your construct is stress shielded. And he did a, a human cadaver study looking at this in Ty Lee's lab. Uh, he uh, looked at it with using tech scans uh, with knotted and knotless constructs and then did load simulation at various degrees of abduction as uh, similar to what was done earlier. Uh, the contact area, as you would expect, was there was no difference between the two types of constructs. Uh, but what they did find is that with the knotted construct, you had a, a worse, um, performing profile on the contact force. You had a lower uh, slope uh, versus the contact force with the knotless, which means that the supraspinatus is compressed more into the footprint uh, when you don't tie knots uh, because the, the load, the load uh, sparing aspect of the knotted construct 
uh, creates a stress shielded area laterally. So knotless repairs had more self reinforcement. Uh, they also had increased uh, uh, pressure contact uh, here uh, with more demonstrating similarly more uh, self reinforcement. And they said that the biomechanical benefits of this is that it's broadly load sharing, that there's no focal tissue strangulation. Uh, the failure loads were equivalent, so it's, it was just as strong as a, a, knot, a knotless repair, or I mean a knotted repair, and it was a, also had a more forgiving type of failure mode because you had less risk of a so-called type 2 tear where it, it tears at the medial knots. Uh, so in, in this study, they concluded that medial knots demonstrate an adverse biomechanical effect by inhibiting self-reinforcement, and they do not improve footprint construct uh, for footprint contract so they concluded that biomechanically the knotless construct is the, is the optimal repair out of these two it's also economical it's faster in the or it's time saving uh, max park has also done a study looking at the efficiency and the number of steps involved in these types of repairs um, well i'll also show that there's faster recoveries and there's and there's fewer revisions uh, with these types of repairs uh, this is some data from the SOS uh, database showing uh, similar results with knotted and knotless, but uh, to about 20 minutes faster in OR time, which if you're doing a number of cases per day can add up quite quickly. Uh, there are kits which include all the implants together, uh, which also have the sutures spledged together, which can make it more reproducible and can also lower the cost in some settings. Uh, this is an example here of a large tear. Uh, here you can see we prepared the footprint. Uh, we do a microfracture on the greater tuberosity, and then we've done an extended linked uh, repair with eight anchors, uh, securing the, the rotator cuff, the infraspinatus and supraspinatus back down onto the greater tuberosity. Uh, what are the five-year outcomes? These are a minimum five-year outcomes of uh, clinical uh, with the clinical outcomes and survivorship. Really, Jonas Pogorshevsky, who's now in practice in Munich, Germany, did a lot of the work here. Uh, Chris Cadigan as well, um, and John Godin, who's one of my partners now. Uh, and these were all my patients. We had 191 shoulders uh, where we looked at this. Uh, mean age was 60. Follow-up was min uh, average of 6.6, .6, a minimum of five years. And we had a 7.9% revision surgery rate. Um, many of these were uh, single tendon tears, about 50% uh, uh, were two tendon tears involving the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, and about 25% uh, uh, 25 of the cases were uh, supraspinatus and subscap, and about 10% involved three were three tendon tears. When we looked at the ASES scores, uh, they, they improved significantly from 57 to 92. This is at a minimum of five years. So 92 is pretty much back to a normal age match control group that never had surgery. Uh, again, the, the SF12s were improving, the quick dash scores, a lower quick dash score is better, and SANE score is getting back to 86. And a median satisfaction on a scale of one to 10 was, was 10. Um, when we looked at the results, we tried to stratify primary repairs had higher ASCS scores than revisions, but revisions still did quite well. So the take home message is revisions can still improve, but primaries are going to do better. Acute tears seem to do better than, than chronic tears. Uh, and um, there was really no difference, interestingly, when we looked at uh, isolated supraspinatus tears versus multiple tendon tears. So in this study, at least size, uh, the size of the tear didn't really have a major, major impact. That may have something to do with the selection that I, I did and who I chose to do the repairs on uh, and who was included in this. But I think if the tear is, re is technically repairable, you should go ahead and try and repair it. Um, survivorship at, at two years was 96.5 and at five years was about 94%. When we looked at the revisions, uh, 15 of them had revisions, nine had other procedures, um, six were for stiffness, one was for uh, pain and occult infection, one hematoma, and one for revision biceps. When we looked at the patients who had uh, symptomatic re-tears, uh, nine of them I revised, six were revised elsewhere. One of these was revised with a revision rotator cuff 
uh, repair. We don't know what the other five had. Of the nine patients that I actually revised, one, I did a lat dorsi transfer. Uh, this was due to a medial row failure with a poor quality tendon remaining. And eight of the patients were actually able to have, uh, were able to be revised with a revision rotator cuff repair. Uh, and the maximum gutelier was grade two. So um, we didn't see any, any uh, really uh, high rates of type two failures in those that did have a revision surgery, only one of the patients. So the clinical outcomes were significantly improved. We had a 7% reoperation rate. Acute and primary repairs had better outcomes than chronic and, um, and revisions. Uh, the type of, interestingly, the type of repair number of tendons involved didn't in influence the outcomes and type two tears were uncommon. Uh, these are the comparative outcomes compared to other studies looking at minimum five-year results. And you can see we're getting results which are very high. They compare it favorably with Patrick Denard's study from 93, but improved over earlier studies as far as the ASCS scores. Uh, this is interesting data. This is a study that I uh, published. These were Dr. Hawkins patients uh, looking at 10-year outcomes with open rotator cuff repairs from our institution. Uh, minimum 10-year follow-up, 11% uh, revision rate, uh, and 83% uh, survivorship at 10 years. Uh, these, this is some data which is going to be presented actually tomorrow at the ASES uh, fellows meeting. This was done, uh, look, looked up by Adam Johansson, who's one of my fellows this year. These are my minimum 10-year outcomes of Transosha's equivalent rotator cuff repairs. Uh, not as high numbers yet, but we had 91 shoulders, minimum of 10-year follow-up, uh, a mean of 11.5, all Transosha's equivalent arthroscopic rotator cuff repairs. Our revision rate was only 5.5% in this series and 95.4 10-year uh, Kaplan-Meier survivorship. So we're go we went from an 83% to a 95% survivorship with these new modifications in our technique from what was being used with the old open techniques with um, transosseous sutures and, and older anchor designs and unlinked constructs to now 95% 10-year survivorship using these uh, linked uh, transosseous equivalent constructs with anchors. We've also looked at uh, our partial thickness rotator cuff repairs. Uh, I think partial thickness tears are very interesting. Uh, they can be repaired in most cases, either with takedown and repair or with just repair of the uh, uh, affected leaflet. This was a series of 20 shoulders looking up, uh, looking at the results at a minimum of five years. We had six bursal and 14 articular sided repair, repairs. Uh, and we found significant increases in the patient recorded outcomes. Uh, the patient age or tear location in this series was not, re record, report, uh, not associated with outcome. And we didn't see any need for any revision surgeries at a minimum of five year follow up. So I know there's a lot of interest in trying to potentially do some augmentations uh, in these types of tears, but at least in our series, at five year follow up, we didn't have re uh, revision surgeries. So perhaps uh, just taking them down and repairing them or repairing them in situ uh, will result in good outcomes and avoids the need for any type of augmentation. Uh, these types of tears uh, are probably some of the most difficult types that I see. These are the tears at the muscle tendon junction. Uh, Zaman Hussein, who was a visiting scholar with us, uh, who's from the UK, uh, helped with this study. And we basically came up with different types of uh, type two tears and how to repair them. Uh, when the tendon is healthy and there's a remaining tendon at the footprint and there's remaining tendon, you can sometimes just do a uh, transosseous equivalent type repair with, with tape and also uh, incorporate additional side to side sutures to repair the tendon to tendon. Uh, in larger tears, when the tendon is of poor quality but the muscle is healthy, uh, you can do some type of augmentation. Uh, and then in massive tears where the tendon is of poor quality and the muscles of poor quality, some other type of reconstructive option with perhaps a superior capsule reconstruction, tendon transfer or reverse shoulder replacement is necessary. Uh, and that's the so-called type C's here. So uh, something to think about, you can usually uh, determine a lot of this on your preoperative imaging. Uh, 
sometimes these occur primarily, most of the time they occur secondary to some type of prior repair, but I have seen a number of uh, these type A tears that occurred primarily where the person had not had a prior, uh, prior surgery and they tore uh, really at the tendon, leaving a tendon footprint here and they can be repaired successfully. What about older patients? Uh, well, I was told in, when I was in my training that you know, patients over the age of 70 really you know, don't do well with rotator cuff repair. And then I came to Colorado and our uh, definition of old changed because our patients are extremely active here. Many of them are skiing, golfing, competing in senior Olympics and different sports. Uh, so I started uh, to do repairs in these older patients. And then um, when Sanjeev Bhatia, who was uh, one of our fellows a few years ago, who's now in practice in, in, uh, at, in uh, Chicago, uh, looked at this and we had 49 patients uh, with full thickness rotator cuff repairs repaired with uh, transosseous equivalent tape bridging constructs. The average age was 73. The minimum was 70. They all described themselves as recreational athletes. And when you look at their ASCS scores, they improved from 57 all the way to 90. The DASH scores improved. And again, the median patient satisfaction was very high. And in this cohort of el uh, elderly patients, 77% of them re reported that they were able to return to sports. So I think just because a patient is older, should not preclude them from an arthroscopic repair. If they have good quality tendon, good quality muscle, they're physiologically young, they're active, I think arthroscopic rotator cuff repair can result in an excellent outcome for them. This is an example of a cardiologist from uh, Texas that I saw. He was told that he sh should just live with his tear. He had a lot of dis disability as a result of it. You can see it was a very straightforward repair. It was a crescent-shaped tear. We did a double row linked repair here using a tape bridging construct. And you can see here the completed repair uh, here, repairing the supraspinatus leading edge of infraspinatus back down at the footprint. And this patient went on to a successful uh, outcome and was quite pleased with his results. Um, I think the leak linked repairs are also very strong. Um, I'm uh, five feet, 10 inches tall. So that gives you a perspective about how tall this guy is. He's considered the world's strongest man. He's won the competition a number of times. 6'8", 430 pounds, uh, just a giant of a person. Uh, and uh, these, uh, he was something I was, someone I was fortunate enough to treat after he injured himself lifting a 450 pound train axle in one of his competitions. Uh, so what we've learned from treating some of these elite athletes is that they're gonna push the limits and our patients wanna push the limits too. So we started uh, allowing them to have earlier physical therapy and earlier range of motion. Uh, historically, uh, many of the patients were just put in a sling for six weeks and told to start physical therapy after six to eight weeks. We started, we've started being more aggressive with early motion. And in a series of my cases, 517 cases, 87% of the patients were able to be cleared for full activities after three and a half months. Uh, we'll usually start passive motion early for a secure repair and then allow active motion after three to four weeks. At six weeks, we'll check an ultrasound when they come back for their six week follow-up visit. If the tear looks good, we'll then let them start strengthening. Uh, and at uh, three and a half to four months, we'll let them get back to full activities. Uh, this, uh, these types of repairs have, uh, give you more confidence because they have less risk of re-tears and we, they also have uh, less risk of re-tears when patients have secondary trauma. There's always things that happen in the post-operative course that go on to try and disrupt your, your successful surgery. Here's an example of a post-operative trauma. Uh, this was a 62-year-old male. He was a recreational athlete. He had a fall while skiing. Uh, here you can see it's his right shoulder. This is visualizing the tear. Uh, he had a posterior superior tear. We did a, a, a standard tape ridge repair. He had a little bit of a dog ear here, so we incorporated this extra suture uh, to deal with the dog ear, but a uh, very successful repair, four anchor repair, um, really quite standard. We let him go back home. Um, at five weeks postoperatively, he fell from a, a four foot stone patio and uh, fractured his distal clavicle, and he called me and said, I think I've messed up your repair. He had this near type one distal clavicle fracture uh, and we got an MRI because it was difficult to examine him. And you can see that the repair was completely intact. The fracture was treated non-operatively 
and at four and a half months postoperatively uh, from his original uh, uh, surgery, and three months after his uh, fall, he reported no pain and full range of motion and no further complications. Um, this is another example here of a post-op trauma. This is a little bit more challenging type of tear. 71-year-old male, he's a very active businessman, he's, but he's also a recreational biker, hiker, skier, and horseback rider. He was thrown from his horse. Uh, he had a, this massive left shoulder uh, rotator cuff tear. He underwent an extended repair of the supra and infraspinatus tendons. Uh, here you can see the repair looking at his left shoulder. Uh, here, uh, secure repair, three anchors medially, three anchors laterally with the tapes uh, crisscrossing and compressing it. Uh, four months postoperatively, he returned to uh, full activities. He saw me in the office. He rated his shoulder as 100%. So this is four months post-op, which is our kind of our typical recovery uh, for one of these. Well, at 11 months postoperatively, he had, was uh, in Aspen, Colorado, where he has a summer home, and he was uh, going down one of the uh, mountain passes, and he had a bike crash going 40 miles per hour. He had an Eidberg type 2 transverse glenoid fracture. He had uh, left, seven left rib fractures with a hemoneumothorax, and he had degloving injury to his scalp. He underwent immediate treatment for these and then called me and said, you know, I, I think I messed up your, your shoulder surgery. You can see here the, the screw hole for the biceps tenodesis uh, and uh, where we did our repair. There's some anchor ch changes from the anchor, but you can also see the glenoid fracture here. Uh, he came to see me and um, he had a weak shoulder. It was difficult to examine him. The MRI showed that the rotator cuff looked intact. Uh, he went to the OR for operative treatment of his glenoid fracture. And here you can see the intraoperative images. He had you know, a crash at 40 miles an hour that broke his glenoid. This is the articular view, intraarticular view of his supra and infraspinatus tendons. And this is the bursal view here uh, showing the tendon healed nicely despite his glenoid fracture. Uh, he underwent uh, arthroscopic reduction of an internal fixation of his glenoid fracture. And by three months, he was fully recovered and back to activity. And ironically, both of these patients came to the office on the same day. This is the 71-year-old gentleman that uh, had a horseback injury and then uh, had a crash on his bike. And this is the gentleman here uh, who lives in Virginia that fell off his patio and had the, the clavicle fracture. Uh, and both of them were quite pleased with uh, their ultimate results. Another example here, 51-year-old otherwise healthy woman with a left uh, rotator cuff uh, tear after a fall while skiing. She had a crescent-shaped supraspinatus tear. She underwent a linked uh, double row repair here, four anchor repair, uh, medial, uh, uh, medial row here, no knots, compressing it down. Six months later, she had returned to full activities and she went back to skiing without any, without any issues. Seven months postoperative, she called me because she fell while skiing. She suffered this proximal humerus fracture, as you can see here. Uh, and uh, was concerned that she had a re-tear of a rotator cuff. We got an MRI because it was difficult to examine her. The rotator cuff was completely intact, treated non-operatively in a sling, and ultimately had a, had a good outcome. So I think um, in 2020, I, I think the goals are, are the same as what Dr. Neer and Dr. Codman taught us. Uh, we want to uh, restore the anatomy and we want to achieve healing. And I think the strength, uh, the anatomic data, the kinematic uh, and the in vivo uh, data now for these anatomic repairs really is, is kind of compelling. Uh, the clinical outcomes that we're getting are, are significantly better than what we had gotten in the past with lower retail rates, lower reoperation rates, lower revision rates, and faster recoveries, uh, which is uh, you know, optimal for our patients. And we're getting uh, pain relief, we're getting functional restoration, not just improved from where they were, but actually back to normal. And we're also getting uh, healing of the tendon back down onto the footprint. So in 2020 and beyond, I think there's a lot of exciting innovation that's happening. Uh, hopefully we can shorten this, these procedures. I think better reconstructive options is still something that uh, is a problem. And hopefully we'll be able to talk about that in the Q&A. Uh, when these uh, re repairs fail, uh, looking at tendon transfers, superior capsule reconstruction, reverse shoulder arthroplasty, 
Predictive analytics is something that we're interested in trying to develop predictive models uh, so we can stratify who's going to do well with what surgery. And in this uh, month's American Journal of Sports Medicine, we have the lead article showing a predictive analytics study on rotator cuff repair, trying to develop this for our patients. And then biologics uh, to enhance and speed healing. We, we talked about using microfracture. I also am uh, using PRP in many cases to try and improve the healing and speed up the healing of the tendons. I'm hopeful that in the future we'll have even more options uh, for this. So with that, I'd like to thank the Indian Arthroscopy Association, uh, Indian, Arth Indian Arthroscopy Society for the opportunity to present, to share my work over the last two decades. Uh, it's really a great honor. Uh, I always learn more than I uh, share, and I'm sure I'll learn a lot in the Q&A. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight, and uh, hope this uh, helps you all with the care of your patients and to get better outcomes uh, for our patients, because that's what our what our ultimate goal is. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Peter. I mean, indeed, it was a wonderful presentation. So, if you can unshare your screen, and we can uh, start with some questions which have come up in the chat box. So, uh, Shriyash, if I can just start with the first question which has come, please, and yes. then you can carry on. Uh, uh, it's still it's still there, uh, so we need to. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. perfect. Yeah, yes, that's perfect. Perfect. Uh, so, uh, in your presentation, uh, Dr. Millet, you said there is a procedure called as cortical augmentation if the bone quality is poor. So, how do you exactly do that cortical augmentation in a place where bone quality is poor when you plan to put anchors? Yeah, if the bone quality is really poor, uh, I think those are challenging cases. Um, in most cases, uh, I think just planning for it ahead of time, placing your anchors immediately next to the articular margin. There's usually good bone there and then going far lateral, there's usually good bone there. And then just being careful not to decorticate the bone at all so that you, the anchors you use have good fixation. If however the bone, and even when there's appear, it appears there's a cyst on the MRI, you can usually just fix it with anchors. But there are cases where the bone is just really poor quality. In those cases, I sometimes will do an open procedure and I'll use a small uh, stainless steel button plate. Uh, Christian Gerber has described it, Synthes makes it, um, and I'll, I'll do a transosseous repair and tie the sutures over the button. Dr. Milius, this is Dr. Samantha from Calcutta. So uh, yes, really this lecture was fantastic. The thing is that when you use this, this three, four, and three meancas medially and three on the lateral with your fiber tapes, do you feel that these fiber tapes are going to strangulate the tissue because tissue quality in the, uh, the healing potential in the rotator cup is extremely poor. Do you have anything or uh, your idea that the, the, the fiber tape or the, the anything like your, the fiber sutures? I think that's a great question. I think that um, my experience has been Initially, I think when I moved to double row repairs, I, I think I was probably strangulating the tissue and that was not with tape, that was with sutures because I was doing all these complex type of repair patterns and tying knots and doing kind of um, The, the sutures initially or the suture tapes initially that there's stress relaxation that occurs within the first hour or so after it's placed that it, it probably loosens up a bit. So I, I don't think it strangulates a tissue and that's not been my experience. I, I mean, we followed the patients now for 10 years. We don't have uh, high, high numbers of type two tears with these uh, types of tears, which is something we would, we, you would think we would see if we were strangulating the tissue. So if you place them about 10 to 12 millimeters apart and you compress them tightly, uh, but you know, not excessively, I, I don't think you're gonna strangulate the tissue. Okay, thank you. I think it needs to be, and I don't know the answer to this, that it needs to be strong enough to hold it in place, um, but no stronger. Um, and I don't know, just, you know, I, I don't know, we don't know that how much tension on the, re, the repair is, is helpful versus how much is would become detrimental and strangulate the tissue. I do yeah. know that tissue doesn't heal to a foreign body, although 
in the second looks I've had, the tissue does grow on the tapes. But um, so by putting in a lot of foreign material, I think you can inhibit healing. But I, I think it's hard to really over tension these. Thank you, Peter. Uh, no, there is a question here. Uh, at three and a half months, you said you clear all the patients for almost all the activities. Uh, our experience is that we actually tend to be a bit more safer and we take a lot more time. Yes. So is it the, your technique, which is somehow or are you dealing with more acute tears? So what in your practice is uh, the reason that you are confident to send them to almost all activities by three and a half months? I think it's a combination of things. Uh, it's evolved over time. I initially was more conservative and it was probably more like six months. But as I've gotten more confident in the strength of the repairs uh, and also treating some of these athletes and things that want to push the limits, um, we, and I've studied my patients carefully. I mean, we're not seeing higher failure rates by letting them go back earlier. Um, I've gotten more confident in letting them return. Now, I treat patients from all over the country. Uh, so although I live at the base of Iscaria, I do treat acute tears, but many of my patients have chronic tears that they've had for months. So it's not that I'm just treating acute tears. Um, that may play a role in it, but many of the patients have chronic tears. One thing that is true in my patient population is that most of the patients are very healthy and they're very active because if they, if they either live in Colorado or they come here, we, we're at 8,000 feet. People who smoke a lot or have a lot of chronic conditions don't usually come to, to our clinic. So I think that may play a role in it, that I have motivated patients that are generally in good health. And they are motivated to get better and they want to get better quickly. Um, so that probably may be part of the reason there's a selection bias in who I'm operating on. Yeah. But I also have a lot of confidence in the repairs. As you saw from some of those studies, they're not all acute tears. About two thirds of them are chronic tears and probably one third in the series are acute tears. So, um, and we have, and uh, you know, the acute tears in our five-year results did slightly better than the chronic tears. But uh, still, we're, we're letting the, even the chronic ones usually return to activities at three and a half to four months. Now, if somebody's older, they have a massive tear, the tissue quality is poor, and at four months, they still have pain or they're down a full motion, then yes, there are certain patients that were going more slowly. And in that series, 13% of the patients were not cleared because they had some type of other problem. So, uh, you know, if, if, you have, if the patient's doing well and they're pain-free and have good motion, I think and you feel like you have a good repair, maybe you Hello? Yeah. Yes, yes. So yes. Uh, any other questions, IPS, from yes, sir, the sir, panel? Satish, Satish was asking one question. Satish? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. My question is, uh, uh, what is your threshold for uh, doing a, a lad, lad dorsal transfer or SCR and uh, what are your indications? Uh, are your indications are different for SCR and different for lad dorsal transfer? That's a great question. Um, historically, um, massive posterior superior tears that were irreparable uh, with an intex or repairable subscapularis uh, I would do a lat dorsi transfer in a younger patient. And that was all we had. Then reverse shoulder came along and most of the time in, in patients over the age of 65 or 70, we do a reverse shoulder replacement. Uh, now we also have the uh, option of doing a superior capsule reconstruction. I have moved, I, I would say that for me, the indications for an SCR uh, replaced what I was doing the lat dorsi transfer for. So a young uh, or physiologically young patient with a posterior superior tear that was technically irreparable, uh, involving the superin infraspinatus tendons with an intact or repairable subscapularis that had at least three out of five abduction strength. If they were totally pseudoparalytic, then I don't think I can restore abduction with an SCR or a tendon transfer. So if they have, you know, they're weak, but you can help them up, then I think they'd be a candidate for that. So for me, that's the, the those are the patients. I also 
uh, prefer minimal osteoarthritis or no osteoarthritis and minimal hamada changes on the acromion. Uh, I've looked at my results from SCR versus lat dorsi transfer and my results from the SCR are slightly better in my hands. So I've kind of gone away from doing lat dorsi transfers and mostly do SCRs. I've also looked at uh, my series of patients that I did that had massive repairs where I was able to margin converge and close it and then repair it and I compared that with SCR because I was curious to know whether should I just do an SCR because the tissue quality is not that great in these patients. So it's a technically repairable tear, but they have poor quality tissue or they have, you know, stage three or four gutelier and the supraspinatus and you can't pull it over. And what I found was that the results, even if we could technically repair it with, a, with, um, with margin convergence and releases, that those results were equivalent to an SCR. So the take home message is if you can repair it, you will get as good a result as you can get with an SCR. If it's not repairable at all, you, no matter whatever technical tricks you have, you just can't repair it, then I go ahead and do an SCR. I've stopped doing lat dorsi transfers. And if they're an older patient, I usually will do reverse. Now I think perhaps there may be a re still a, a role for a tendon transfer, either with a lower, uh, with an upper tear, upper uh, trap or, um, or with a um, uh, lat dorsi transfer in patients who have mostly infraspinatus tears that have significant external rotation weakness. But that's a really rare subset of patients in my practice. Okay. Uh, Sundar, you had a question. Yeah, Sundar. I hope that was a long answer, but I hope it was helpful. No, that, that it's sorted out. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, my, my question is I think the transversus uh, double toe repair, which uh, I think you are doing by open. So uh, I want to know how do you decide your cases between your double row speed bridge repair or transverse repair? Is it intraoperative decision uh, because that is an arthroscopy and this is an open procedure? So how do you decide your indications for your transverse repair? I do pretty much all arthroscopic repairs. So when it, when when it, I talked about transosseous equivalent, I was talking about an arthroscopic technique. Okay. Uh, with medial row anchors and lateral row anchors connecting them. Uh, I rarely do a transosseous repairs anymore unless the patient may have like terrible bone quality and I'm doing some type of a cortical augmentation or it's uh, some type of a case where I'm doing a, a graft augmentation of a, a healthy muscle but a short tendon and I'm, I'm putting in a large graft uh, so most of the time, these are done arthroscopically. Uh, Peter, you end up uh, using between four, six, and up to eight anchors. Uh, so, I mean, uh, can you preoperatively, do you have a formula depending upon the size of tear that you can tell the patient that I would end up using eight anchors or six anchors? It's a cost of issue. So that is, uh, so have you devised some kind of formula or is it just on the table that you decide? I, I don't decide, it doesn't make a difference to us if we tell the patients ahead of time. So um, usually, I mean, you can tell by the size of the tear on the MRI, but ultimately it's an intraoperative decision-making after I've debrided the tear and looked at it from all different uh, orientations. Uh, and I usually look at it from posteriorly, and then I make two lateral portals, posterior lateral and anterior lateral, and I look at it from both those tears and debride it, both those portals and debride it and then make the decision uh, if the tear is greater than 25 millimeters in, in anterior to posterior dimension, then I usually will use more than two anchors medially. Okay, okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, so it was an excellent uh, overview and uh, excellent talk, Dr. Milik. So uh, I have a couple of questions if I may. So firstly, while we are at technique, uh, in, in the large retracted full thickness tears where the tear is gone up to the glenohumeral joint and we are yes. able to restore it back to the footprint when we do the trial reduction, would you consider adding a pulley across the two medial anchors? Because we are fixing the medial uh, uh, anchors at two points. So there is a gap in between. So especially from a healing perspective, do you ever consider using the eyelet sutures to just bridge across and compress that medial part of your reconstruct? 
Yes, I, I think that's a technique uh, that some have called like a jet bridge technique or it has different names. Um, I think in some tears, uh, I actually medialize it in some of those large tears, I'll medialize the footprint a few millimeters so that there's less tension on it. I will use the eyelet sutures to secure the tendon to provide additional fixation. I don't like gapping. Uh, I like the tendon to be compressed down onto the footprint. So there's a variety of different adaptations you can make intraoperatively depending on how the, how the tendon's gonna lay on the footprint. But those are, that's one technique that's utilized. Um, and I use that sometimes in, in some cases. I, I would say that I don't do that commonly, but that is a technique which can be used to achieve additional compression. And there's, I know that there's some surgeons that feel that that's important and it seals the, um, the tendon from the articular surface so that they don't have the synovial fluid at the tendon bone interface where it's healing. And if you were to do that in a certain case, would you yes. put your lateral row anchors first and then tie the pulley or would you tie the, the bridging or the, the J tag first and then put your lateral row anchors? I would personally probably, if I were doing that technique, I would personally probably tie, I'd probably secure it laterally first so that I achieved a broad footprint. I would worry that it might um, restrict the mobility of the tendon coming over as far laterally as it might go if you tied it down medially first. Okay. Absolutely. That's what I've done. I used okay. to do it the cowboy way, trying the medial side first, but then the, the, the risk, uh, the concerns about retears have come up. So I like you do the lateral row first and then do the medial. Yeah. yeah. Some people have called that stitch a guillotine stitch. So, yes. you know, yeah, I think you, if you tie that down, you don't want to make it extra tight. Exactly. Just it's, 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 it's holding the tendon down onto the footprint. It doesn't have to be compressing it down and cutting into the tendon. Because I think the tendon is weaker there medially and you wanna try and stay in the tendon itself, not into the muscle. Um, and on some of those large tears, you know, you're kind of, to pull it over far enough, you're getting at the muscle tendon junction and it's not as strong there. So you have to be a little bit, you know, that's where the judgment and the art of what we do comes in. Yes, excellent. Yep, you have a question? Co oh. Sorry, uh, IPS if I may. Uh, coming to the partial tears, now, do you use the 50% rule to decide whether to operate or not to operate? And how do you choose between a takedown versus an in-situ repair? Yes, yeah, so that's a great question. I, um, I have a whole talk on partial thickness tears. I have a whole test on talk on massive and complex tears, and I'd love to come and, and share those, that info with you. But my approach with the partial tears is that the articular sided tears um, I will debride it from the, from the articular side. You know, this is assuming they fail conservative treatment and they've reached surgery. So on the articular side of tears, I'll debride it. I'll look at it from the articular side. I'll look on the MRI to make sure it doesn't have significant delaminations because sometimes they'll have large delaminations between the two tendon leaflets and you, you can't always see that arthroscopically if you, unless you really have seen it on the MRI. Then I'll look on the bursal side and if the, if the tissue looks totally normal on the bursal side and it looks very healthy, then I'll do a, a pasta type repair. If however, that remaining tissue looks suspicious at all, then I, I personally do a takedown and repair. For the bursal side of tears, I do the same thing. I look at the articular side, go to the bursal side. I would say the bursal side tears, I have a, have a greater likelihood of leaving the articular side intact and just doing a partial repair. The pasta repairs I've gone away from more. I, I occasionally do them, but more frequently I do a takedown and repair. When I looked at my results, the pasta repairs had the worst, they, they, they improved, but the pasta repairs had the worst results. The takedowns and the bursal sided tears had the best results. So to me that says, even if there's some people that think we're getting a length tension mismatch, I think we're leaving residual tendinosis there when we do a pasta repair and they still hurt. Because when we do a full repair, we don't have trouble with stiffness. When we do a takedown and repair, I don't have trouble with stiffness. Uh, so I've gone towards a lower threshold for doing a takedown and repair. I, I don't know if that's right, it's not randomized, but um, as I've moved through my career, I've, I've done more 
more takedowns and repairs of the partial repairs, partial oh. thickness tears. Yes, sir. And, and just, uh, just my final question, you know, yes. rega regarding your study uh, in the 70 years old and older where you got excellent results. Now we know that there are three main variables which determine the poor outcome after rotator cuff repair. One is the advanced age. Second is the uh, size of the tear. And third is fatty infiltration. So did you, when you chose those 70 and above to repair them with your double row technique, was it that the extent of fatty infiltration and the tendon quality was like a slightly younger patient and that's why you managed to get good results compared to otherwise? Yes, now I didn't have time to go through the selection criteria for the, for the studies, but in, my, in our large series, we didn't find, surprisingly, we didn't find that larger tears had worse results. And in the older patients, we didn't find that older patients had worse results. So I think if you're careful with your selection, I think that the most important thing is probably the muscle tendon quality and the mobility of that. And sometimes you can, you can predict that based on the MRI uh, ahead of time. If they have really severe fatty infiltration, I, I don't usually recommend um, arthroscopic repair for those patients. They usually are getting a reverse shoulder replacement or conservative non-operative treatment with injections and physical therapy. So it's probably somewhat due to the selection. This is not all 70 year olds with rotator cuff tears. This is all 70 year olds who are, you know, physiologically pretty active patients who have repairable rotator cuff tears with Goutelier three or less uh, muscle tendon quality. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, Pratik, yeah. yeah. My question was quite similar to what the third question um, Shiresh has asked. For You have an extensive experience with uh, 70 plus. So do you do something differently with them? Because obviously uh, you are getting good results. Uh, also, um, what do you find? That, like they are able to get good ASES and DASH scores. Are they able to maintain it, um, you know, for like a durability wise? So do you do anything differently with the 70 plus or approach same? It's pretty much the same approach, although if they're a little bit older, we may be a little bit more conservative with letting them go back to uh, healing. We, you know, we have a post-operative protocol where we ask them not to use anti-inflammatory medications for six weeks. Uh, if they're a smoker, we usually don't, you know, we try not to, we don't have very many smokers in our series, and we encourage people that are smoking not to smoke. Mm -hmm. um, and you know we usually will use PRP in those patients as well uh, at the time of surgery, and we're very careful about uh, preparing the bone carefully uh, so that it's bleeding, but that we're not decorticating it, so we're not weakening it, weakening it at all. It at all. Um, but other than that, there's not significant differences uh, between that and our younger our younger cohort of patients. I have minimum two year follow up. I have, I know some patients are doing well at, at, at 10 years after a rotator cuff repair that were in their 70s. For example, that case that I showed you, which was the cardiologist from Texas with the rotator cuff repair, I know he's 10 years out now and he sent me a letter saying, thank you, you know, I'm doing fine. Uh, so he's doing well. You know, his activity level decreases as it, all, as, as it does for most people as they age but he's still not in pain and he's able to do the activities of daily living and his sports that he enjoys. And PRP, you do intratendinous or you do the microfracture and get the biologics working? So you said you use PRP also. So we is it? We inject PRP at the time of surgery. We drain the joint and then we close the portals and inject PRP and bathe the, the area in, in PRP at the time of surgery. Uh, we're to, looking at BM, using BMAC and we're looking at doing PRP, you know, post-operatively. It's, it's, it's a covered service. If it's done intra-op, it's part of this, the global fee for surgery. If we do it afterwards, then it's, insurance doesn't always cover it and patients, you know, would have to pay out of pocket. So we usually don't do it. It's just a practical uh, reason why we don't do it post-operatively. Uh, Dr. Millet, in a type A type of tear of a muscle tendon junction, in addition yes. to doing a speed bridge, you said you would actually do a tendon to tendon repair as well? Yes, I usually use the eyelet sutures from the medial anchors uh, and I do a tendon to tendon repair as well uh, just, to just to hold it in place and anatomically reduce the tendon to the tendon. 
And that seems to work really nicely for those tears. And then I'll use a shaver underneath the tendon leaflet that's left laterally so that there's tendon is reapproximated down onto the bone. So that tendon is sewn to the bone and to the, the tendon stump that's, that's lateral. And I, I've seen those mostly, they've occurred in, in revisions, but I have seen a number of primary type two tears uh, over the years. The, the patient never had, you know, never had a prior surgery and they've torn it in the tendon as opposed to off the bone. But, but in a chronic tear, when, when the tendon itself is so small, so do you modify yes. your surgical technique? How do you, do you augment it or how do you do it? Yes, uh, I would consider that like a type B where they have a healthy muscle and a type and a short tendon. Yeah. And in those cases, I will do a speed bridge type repair or transosseous equivalent with tapes, but I'll incorporate a patch over it as well and I'll augment it. And those I sometimes will do, I still do those sometimes open because if it's a larger tear, there's a lot of sutures and suture management. Um, and uh, we, have a, we have a video on that and a paper on that as well that um, shows the technique. But I usually, if the, if the tendon is very short, I think those are the ones that may really benefit from augmentation. Um, the other ones that may benefit from augmentation, and you, you've all probably seen these, are the patients that I call them, they have severe tendinopathy. The, the tendon is intact, but it's all stringy and it just is really poor quality. And you put the sutures in and it's like sewing, you know, just a frayed rope or wet tissue paper. And in those cases, I think maybe uh, augmentation with some type of a collagen scaffold would make sense as well. So, so you repair uh, and then put a scaffold over it and then stitch it back? I don't know what to do. I, I ha, you know, I, I, it's something that it's kind of a, a concept that's evolving in my mind as, as we start thinking about using these patches. But I've, what I've done is I've repaired it and then I've either incorporated the patch into the repair or put the patch over the top. I, I don't have... I don't have a set method yet, but it's something that is an evolving concept that I'm, I'm thinking about because I've, I've seen those patients where, and you probably have seen them too, where the, the tendon just looks really terrible. It's not a big tear or anything, but it's just really poor quality tendon. And I think maybe we can help those with some type of biologic scaffold. Uh, as we understand, do you now calculate the critical shoulder angle in almost all your patients for a rotator cuff repair and then try to modify it? Yes, I would say we modify, if you just do a standard acromioplasty uh, with an anterolateral acromioplasty using a cutting block technique, you will modify it slightly. Uh, but if the, if the critical shoulder angle is larger than 35, um, then I also will consider doing a lateral acromioplasty. And particularly if the, if the acromion slopes down too, then I think those are the ones that they can get lateral impingement, uh, I think, from the acromion. Uh, you know, acromioplasties are as a controversial subject. Um, there's a, a lot of debate about whether we need to do acromioplasties or not. I, I believe that there is an, uh, a, a, a conflict that occurs between the tuberosity and the rotator cuff and the undersurface of the acromion. Whether that's primary or secondary, you can debate. But I think there are certainly, there's certainly biomechanical evidence that a lateral extent of the acromion or severe hook can uh, anterolaterally can be problematic. But in any of your data, have you seen a CSA on the other side, which is asymptomatic and maybe patient has got a normal CSA of 35? I don't know the answer to that. You know, we don't usually get x-rays on the asymptomatic side. It's a great question. It would be really interesting natural history study to look at that and see if, you know, patients with elevated CSAs yep. develop rotator cuff tears. Uh, we don't... We, there's no longitudinal study that has looked at that that I'm aware of, um, but it would be really, it would be a great natural history study and maybe we should start getting x-rays on the contralateral side just to, just to look and see what their CSA is. We know that many patients get, you know, bilateral disease yeah. so um, back, back, and that might be a reason why. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so personally and on behalf of the Indian Arthroscopy Society, I'd like to thank you for participating. We really appreciate you taking time off and uh, talking to us and sharing your experience. And we look forward to a collaboration in the future and hopefully we'll get you to India when everything settles down. You have a well, great day. Thank you very much, Suresh. It's uh, my pleasure. Thanks. It's a great honor for me to be invited. I'd like to thank all the faculty for taking the time. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you all in person soon.
Yeah. Thanks a lot. Have a great day. Thank Bye. You, Bye. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, friends, uh, thank you for attending this webinar today. It was our 50th webinar. And thanks to the entire team of Indian Arthroscopy Society Executive Committee, including our dynamic secretary, Dr. Samantha, and our Executive Committee members. Uh, we have uh, another good webinar tomorrow, and it's on ankle stability. And the master of ankle arthroscopy, uh, Professor Von Dijik from Netherlands, he's going to join us tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, again, I must thank Dr. Shriyat for arranging uh, such a wonderful personality to talk to all of us. Uh, we have been seeing his cadaveric videos on ankle arthroscopy and have listened to him numerous times. But I think it would be a treat for us to discuss one-on-one -on -one about ankle instability. So tune in to IES YouTube channel tomorrow at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, for this uh, ankle instability a webinar uh, hosted by Professor uh, C. Uh, Nick Wandiji. Thank you very much, friends. Thank you, Dr. Millet. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night. Yeah. Good night. So can we uh, ending the stream now? Yeah, end the stream, please. Thank you. Thank you all. Okay. Bye bye. Stay safe. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Hope to see you in person soon. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. We'll be inviting you to our annual meeting. Yeah, bye. Yeah. Great. So, thank you, friends. I think yeah, uh, you can stop recording. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Uh, hello.